then, you know, you wrote a wonderful piece once called Our Beginnings Never Know Our Ends. And of course, obviously, it applies to you, I would think, because you've spent, what, 60 odd years now in Sri Lanka. But before that, you were born in Germany. And then you left Germany to go to England. And I suppose you would never have thought when you were 10 years old that you would live here. But let me just ask you, because we are focusing much on Sri Lanka, what was it like to come here in the late 40s, early 50s, married to a very distinguished Sri Lankan professor, but who already had children by a previous marriage, and then settled down? Um, well, it was quite an ordeal, but I think what happened was that I was very young. Um, I had lived through several crises um, in Germany, first of all with Hitler, and I managed to get out, and then going to England, and the war broke out, and my school was in a dangerous zone because England, uh, Germany might attack from the sea. So all foreigners were thrown out, and they wanted to send me out of the school, but somehow I managed to stay behind, so that was the second crisis. So when, after I met my husband and my aunt threw up her hand, my aunt was my guardian because my parents were not there at all, and she was absolutely horrified. And she said, well, you can't marry this man because uh, he probably has a harem, and he put you into a harem. Being a German girl, my nationality was German. I was not able to get a scholarship because it was a, because of the war. And so I was, I thought the best thing is I do first of all my midwifery. So I went to, um, to King's College. And my husband happened to be there doing his postgraduate, whatever. And somehow we met and whatever. And um, I was studying very hard for my midwifery exam. They used to take me out. And um, then finally he asked me to marry him. So we had a very quiet wedding. We had no money, right. none whatsoever. So then further problems. He was born in England, was he? Oh, right. I don't know, well, he was born in England because at that time there were no aeroplanes that right. you hopped into. It was just after the war. But what happened was that um, you could only travel by boat after the baby was uh, six months old. Right. Now, Dad had to get back. He had right. passed his exams, yeah. we had our honeymoon, yeah. and he had to go back here. So then he uh, came back, and uh, I was there. I was pregnant at the time. And then Ananda had a very dramatic birth. Mm -hmm. um, I went into a little flat mm -hmm. by myself while I was pregnant. The hospital wouldn't release me. Right. I said, I'm getting too fat now. You have to let me, have nothing doing. You're just putting on a little weight. You have to work as long as you can. So I was working until right near the end. And the landlady's daughter was a very nice young girl. So she and I went to see, to a film, to see Somerset Worms. He has written a story about a circus where somebody dies from a high board Mm -hmm. into a barrel, right. right? So at the moment, that very tense moment, at that moment, the membranes ruptured oh, in cinema. Right. So <laughs> anyway, um, they carted me off to hospital. Yeah. I went to the very nice hospital and Ananda was born. And then you so had to then come I had to wait for four years, for four months. Right. All the women used to say to me, how is it that your baby is such a beautiful tan? <laughs> you know, right. and I used to push out the arm and then his white sheets yeah. and with his nice skin and whatever. And I said, oh, it's very simple. I feed him carrots. <laughs> mm. so, so they fed him carrots. So, so, yeah. so anyhow, then the two of us had to come back by ourselves mm -hmm. here by boat. And that was a nightmare of a journey because he howled all the way from Southampton to Colombo. Did you have a cabin to yourself? Or did you have a cabin to yourself? Or probably we not? had a cabin to ourselves, but that didn't help right. because every time I wanted to go to a meal, he yeah. wanted to go, I mean, he had to be taken along. Right. Every time a steward would come with his baby and say, Madam, you know. 
So anyhow, we arrived here. Dad hadn't seen the baby. Right. Anyway, a very nice baby. Yeah. At that time, when I arrived, you arrived at the old harbor. Right. And outside. And so Dad had to come on a little boat mm. and take us off the right. boat. That was a wonderful reunion. Right. What is intriguing is that having come here with our number, and then had three children more, and you know, your daughter Shanti grew up with my sister, and the families were quite close. But then I found, as it were, when I came back from university, your children had all gone away, and you have been alone here. Of course, they come and visit, but they've settled abroad in yeah, their various they've, ways. They've, and you are now the sole inhabitant of this house, except for your fantastic staff. So, how do you manage in terms of seeing this now as your base? Uh, well, I have, a, until I fell ill, we are not going to talk about this illness, but I've had a very busy life. I started um, when I was about, um, well, when Renuka, my youngest daughter, was about, I would say, uh, seven years old. She started swimming abroad and all that right. sort of thing. I started thinking, now, what am I going to do? Because my husband was older than I myself, so he right. died earlier. And I had always wanted to write. I'd already written, as a 10-year-old, I wrote a play, you know that. Yes. A German yeah. play in verse, yeah. no less. That's something we had in common, because I think you were one of the first I showed my play to, when uh, I was 16 that is or 17. Right. Absolutely, yeah. yes. That is a Yes, I think I have seen your work when you were right at the beginnings of yes. things. No? That's right. Anyway, um, so then what happened was that I decided I was writing a little bit. When I was 14, I had a poem published in England in a woman's own. And in English? In English. I just learned English. Yes, exactly. But anyway, they, they paid me, so that was very important. So anyway, after that, um, then I started nursing, and then I got married, and then this family, and all this upheaval. But I was writing, you know, now this family was a little bit problematical. Mm -hmm. I've written a story called The Stepmother, which is me, of right. course. About Dar's early children from his first marriage. That, that story has become very uh, famous. BBC has taken right. that. Yes. It's, um, but the, 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 the person who is really the hero mm -hmm or the villain of the piece, uh, denies ever having read the story. Anyway, um, but then I thought, well, I think I must solidify this a bit, and I decided that I would like to have some kind of training. And so I announced to the joint family that I was going to the Polytechnic in Valewatte. And so they threw up their hands in horror, and my husband said, nothing doing, you can't go there. And the children said, you will never pass, <coughs> you'll never pass the examinations, you will fail and you'll be disgraced to the family, and so on, you can't put your name. So I ignored the lot and I went. And I had a lovely time. I That's a writing class. What? A writing class, was it? Or? At the Polytechnic, I yeah. had to go three times a week lectures and um, classes and exam at the end. On writing or? On yes, writing. on um, journalism, short story right. writing, right. Um, poetry writing and the law. Right. So then at the end I had, we had a very good teacher. Who was it? Um, I can't remember right. his name. And then uh, I asked him at the end, he must be dead and gone by now, I said to him, do you think it's worthwhile my my continue with it. He said, oh, yes, you continue, but you have to find out whether people will take your work. So then it so happened that Renuka went for a swimming meet, as you know, in Singapore, and I wrote that poem, yes, and Mervyn de Silva took it yeah. for the editorial page. And that was my first sort of real success, and I never looked back. No, I because was. I know when I came back, as it were, and the British Council decided that we really had to do something for Sri Lankan writing in English. Yes. You know, my, my two mainstays ah, that were you. when we put up the English Writers' Cooperative. Before that, in the early 80s, we tried to celebrate, and you and Jean Ralston were the established writers. Yes. 
And no, then, I took a long time to be established. So by the I 80s, a, you were well I, established. I was an outsider, you know. Well, by the 80s, you were pretty well known. And I really mm. appreciate the fact that, you know, when I started the New London Review, yes. I could count on you. Mm. But then, I think when I thought, look, I shouldn't be doing this by myself, and we started New Ri uh, English Writers Cooperative, yeah, we you were good. fantastic. I mean, you mm. not only were on the founder editorial board, mm. but when I left the British Council, you ran it practically single-handed. I did. And I, I think did. you kept it going. Fantastic. Yeah, for 20 years. How did years. you relate to the, both the old established writers and the new ones? And what are the differences between, let's say, the pioneering days when you started writing, when English writing was not very much accepted, yeah. and the 90s, by which time it was really yeah, quite acceptable quite, to write in English? There was a person called Stuart Weaver. Do you remember him? He I came never from knew the him, but I'd heard of him. yes. He came from the British Council, and he wrote an idiotic sort of article in the paper mm -hmm. about elephants and I don't know what. So I uh, responded to that, mm -hmm. and I told him that he shouldn't write about things he doesn't mm -hmm. know about. And then he invited me to his, uh, and I think Punya County was there. There were two or three people, and this girl who beca became a Buddhist uh, nun. Suvimali. Yes, Suvimali was there. Nobody <coughs> had ever recognized Suvimali. Suvimali was a superb writer, and she wrote about Sri Lanka the way I wanted to learn about Sri Lanka. So that was a starting point. But then when you set up the, the uh, English Writers' Cooperative with Maureen, yes. Maureen Senevratne, um, I found that a wonderful opportunity. But it is now, it's now declining because people are changing. Uh, people, you know, the objective of this English Writers' Cooperative was to allow local writers all over the island um, to have a source, I mean, a, a place to publish. And now that has changed. Now the people who are members like to publish themselves. I shouldn't say this, but it is so. And I find that very sad, because now I have done a review of that in my, um, I don't know whether you've ever seen that, six, that sixth year in 2000, mm -hmm. I wrote on the previous uh, period, right. and how many writers. We had over 260 yeah. people, and of those, I don't know how many people have written books because they all send me copies mm -hmm. and poetry and what have you. There's been a tremendous, because they had a chance. And our criterion was excellence, yeah. nothing else. It didn't matter who we, we were. We had a good, tough editorial board policy. Sorry? We had a very good editorial board yes, policy. Yes, and also we didn't allow politics, right. nor religion. Right. But now anything goes, and I don't really? approve of that at all. And also we had a rule that only people who had published could be actually members of the English Writers' Cooperative because we wanted to raise the standard. But um, I don't know, I resigned. I resigned yes. because I couldn't go along with that. I think just in time. Your poetry has a wonderful range. Yes. But one thing that particularly struck me is how you, along with one or two other writers, are perhaps the best exponent of the very difficult and bloody times through which we lived you know, poems like landscapes. Mm. And I was wondering what relationship you see between, you know, the horrors you experienced as a Jew in Nazi Germany, and then what happened in Sri Lanka in 1971, and then again in the 80s. And you've captured it really extraordinarily movingly. Do you feel there's a connection there as well? Absolutely, because, you know, my experience in Germany um, people don't realize, unless you have lived through that horrible period, the fear, the constant fear, the, the fear of being your neighbors, of your, um, you had no chance. Now as children, we couldn't do this, that, and the other. Um, but this is a fear that has really accompanied me all my life. When I came here, um, and during the bad periods we had, I get, got each of the children a little suitcase 
and they said, you pack your toothbrush and some pants and this and that and the other, just in case we have a problem, because it was so close. You know, around here we had problems and what have you. And even today, there's hardly a day when I don't compare my life to that of my parents. It, it's there. You can't, and you know, that's why I am so pessimistic. I know you are the advisor to the president on reconciliation. No one takes my advice. No, no, never mind. You are the advisor to the president. But you know, when these things happen, which are so vital and so final, um, is there a possibility? Now, I went back to Germany. And the first time I landed, after 44 years, they put me aside, not because I was a Jew or because I was uh, an extreme or whatever, but because I worked for Amnesty International. They wanted to know whether I was a spy or whether I was going to be a problem in Germany. Uh, they released me after some time. But, um, you know, it is an experience that doesn't go away. And I wonder whether a real reconciliation, if one shouldn't find something which is more like an equilibrium. But reconciliation, I think, is not quite the right word. Because I have never ceased. I mean, I have friends who are German, but you never forget. And you look at a person and you say, what were they doing at that time? I think I can see that. I think there is a distinction, though, between not forgetting. And I think some of your poems emphasize that. Yeah. It is evil yeah. to forget. You know, I made a film in Germany. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? Yes. You mentioned With Michael Lenz. Yeah. Yes. And um, he did some research uh, before that. We did a Gallup poll. Mm -hmm. And he sort of asked the local population in my hometown, and they said, what happened to all the Jews who used to live? We had a population of about uh, 4,000, three, 4,000 Jews in our synagogue. And they said, they didn't know. And then he asked another lot and said, what, what happened to all the Jews who used to live in this town? And then they said, well, somehow they were taken away. And then he asked another lot and they laughed. And they said, they went up in smoke. I think I would agree with what you said about the need to remember, and it's horrifying when people don't. But I also think you can move towards both forgiveness and understanding. That doesn't mean excusing. And I think that's what we need to in Sri Absolutely. Lanka. I, I think that is absolutely true. Um, the only thing is that we are moving on. We are all, I mean, the people who have been involved in all these problems are getting older. Mm -hmm. Now I must be one of not so many survivors who are left alive to tell the story as it really was. Mm -hmm. Because now you find the second generation taking over and it's no longer, they, they haven't got that kind of, that feeling that Germany induced in people. It's only, not only me. Mm -hmm. you recently there's been a book written uh, in the Garden of Beasts. Have you heard about it? No, no. It's, it's a Tiergarten in Berlin. Right, yes. And it is about that period. And an American ambassador um, is assigned to Berlin. And then he encounters this uh, situation. You know, um, what happens is that when we are gone, we mean the generation who experience all this, um, it will be all history. And history is, of course, always deceptive and biased. I, I have to say one thing that I find, I know that having worked for Amnesty, you agree with me, is that perhaps one of the most upsetting factors is how in Israel, of having is, in Israel, there, are, there is total forgetfulness of what it was to be a victim. Exactly. And I think the way that sometimes mm. they use the victimization, which must never be forgotten of the Jews yeah, in Germany, right. has transformed mm. into a different form of victimization. Right. And that is also what we saw in Sri Lanka yeah. with the LTT. Yeah, and exactly. That's horrifying. 
But in Sri Lanka, people have a very happy sort of um, temperament on the whole, apart from the bad temper and the moments of violence and what have you. And I find that here, I don't know how it is in India or in other Asian countries, I've lived mainly here, um, there is a fantastic ability to forget. Right. I mean, and I think forgetting is not a good thing. And I think children must be taught history, and especially German children. Now, in Germany, um, in one school, they said, no, we don't, don't teach about the Holocaust because it's not good for children. I mean, a ludicrous statement, considering what the Germans did to the children, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I think it is important to remember. I but I think you also need to remember in a holistic way. And I feel sometimes the Israeli governments don't do that. You know, they remember selectively. Yeah, right. And but governments also, they, they don't really all know. Their historical knowledge, I mean, not every MP or every is educated to the extent that you are, mm. that you know what is what. So you have to take into account that some of these people haven't got a clue. And you know these people who advocate Hitler and who still promote, you still have this neo-Nazi movement going on and gaining power sometimes. I was very glad to find that uh, Mrs. Uh, what is her name in Germany? The, um, Angela uh, Merkel, huh? the Chancellor. Angela, yeah. I, I have a great admiration for her. Right. She's a great woman. I really like her. East Germany. And She's from East Germany. East Germany. And very, um, yes, and very solid. Uh, basic uh, education and hard working and a lot of common sense and very understanding and very simple. We should have a few more like that. Now that's more another women thing. politicians in Sri Lanka would help. Don't? We don't have enough women that, politicians That is what I was just going to say. We have, but we don't have a chance, do we? I think there are problems. Can I move on, to, on yeah, this sure. to a mm. really an aspect of this, which is something that perhaps we need to emphasize more. Your, Lyrical and love poetry mm. is also fantastic, and it's it also fantastic, and it expresses mm. also in a very restrained way a strong uh, sexuality. Mm. Now, Atheria to me is one of the most beautiful but most powerful poems. Which one is that? Atheria. I you like that? I one. love that very much, and that yeah. those last few lines. Yeah, the the trees and the garden. Yeah. In fact, you know there was an article in the paper here. Yes, and I saw your answer. But they didn't the put the letter. Is that there yet? Yeah, but I wrote a letter to the editor yeah. and I said that we have this in the garden and this is these yeah. are the legends about the yeah. tree. And Mr Navaratna, wasn't it? Mr. Navaratna is welcome to come and take some clippings because you mustn't buy them. Yeah. They must be gifted or they come on their own. But he hadn't published the letter. I was very upset about that. No, no, the letter was published. I didn't see it. I saw that. it, yes. Ah. But of course, what was missing in that is those last three lines, which are so sensuous, and like Andrew Marvel, the words of a sleepy mm. that we should all be dead. Because mm. no, also what we should stress is how you moved from Germany to England and then became a distinguished poet in English, and mm. uh, writing in your second language. Yeah, now that is, is another big problem, because German, I had no... I refuse to speak German. Right. Why should I speak the language of the murderers of my parents? But then, when I went to Germany, I had a friendship. Um, a person who was uh, actually, um, um, what shall I say, um, a doctor of literature, who was very upset mm. that my education in German, he had read my English poetry and they published it. Yeah. And uh, then he uh, showed me some of the German poetry. And I must say, I, I, I was quite uh, overwhelmed mm. by some of the poets, the older poets, even the younger poets, there are some very good poets. Mm. And um, I have translated, there are some lovely poems. No, your translations of Rilke. Burn? Your translations of Rilke yes. are really good. I published some of them many yes. years ago in the New yeah, I like Review. Rilke. He's very, uh, yeah. Yes, there's a lovely one about Orpheus. Yes. yes. That one I really like. That's a lovely poem. I used that at the German Culture Institute. Of course, the German Culture Institute, um, finally, we cooperated quite a lot. Mm. And I had a lovely relationship. Did you ever write the, po write the poem about um, Anna Blume? 
Yes. This is that one. You know, that was at the 2000, uh, the, um, what you call that, there was this uh, exhibition in Hanover, and it was worldwide the competition. Right. That they invited me, but I didn't go because they wanted to, me to stay with the German family. Ah, I and said, you didn't no, want to do you. that. Mm. No, no way. <laughs> again, one of this, mm. the one thing is to go back to the title again of one of your books. Mm. You know, with words we write our lives. Yes. And I think you've had this long experience in Germany, mm. then coming here, mm. your work on the old sites in Sri Lanka, Dambulla, for mm. the Naro, mm. and then, of course, the years of conflict. Mm. And then all through this, this strain of family, mm. of love. Yes. Mm. I think it's a fantastic you sort know, of the, range um, the, of this sort of, um, subjects. This family thing it was uh, very, very important. Yeah. Um, you know the story of um, the sari that fell down when I had to pay my respects to the Vice Chancellor? No, no, I didn't <laughs> know that. And that is now my husband uh, worked with Sir Nicholas Articula. Yeah. And after I came, about a week, I, my husband was with him. Yeah. And after about a week of coming here, my husband said that the boss wants to see you. Yeah. So then I said, okay. So my husband, being totally airy fairy, said, you have to wear a sari. So I said, okay. So then somebody put you, then they asked me what color. I said, black, I love black. 23 or 24, right. and, uh, lovely morning, sun shining. I appear in full black, blouse and sari, and I didn't know how to drape it. So the only people who could help me were Kushi uh, and Aki. The two stepdaughters. Two stepdaughters. One was nine mm. or eight, the other was 12 or 13. Mm. They also didn't know very much. So anyhow, we did the best we could, and then I marched off with my husband to see Sir Nicholas. And then halfway through the proceedings, I felt that something wasn't right. And I found that the whole thing had absolutely... I comforted Marnia with that the other day when she was here. And the sari collapsed. The sari collapsed. So then, then Sir Nicholas's wife took me, Lady Articula took me into home, and she said, now let me teach you how to wear sari. But Sir Nicholas took me to another room and he gave me a good grilling and he told me that there was a synagogue here in Colombo mm -hmm. and uh, that the origins of the synagogue were during the war when uh, Montgomery was the, um, you know, the overall, right. um, yes. what you call it? Uh, Mountbatten. Mountbatten, I'm right. sorry. Mountbatten was the overall. Um, that the um, soldiers from the Middle East and whatever would come here for their um, rest. Yeah. And this was the place where the Jewish soldiers from all over were coming. So I looked for the place, I found it. Mm. It's not, it was an ordinary house, but it had a mezuzah. Mm. A mezuzah is a small thing that you stick onto the door with mm. the Jewish prayer inside. Yeah. And that was still there. But now it's been pulled down and it's no longer there. Well, since your sari slipped many yeah. years ago, you haven't put a foot wrong. So thank you very <laughs> much indeed. Okay, well, that's very nice of you today to Today and that. for having been with us mm. for 60 years. Yes. Well, I, I have been very happy here and I have expressed my happiness and my gratitude in as many ways as I can. But I'm not an uncritical. Uh, what should I say, viewer from the outside, but it's useful to have somebody who is both inside and outside. Okay? Thank you.